Allah and man Allah and man Allah and man Allah and man I said one Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadur Rasulullah. I start out our khutbah with that simple affirmation. That simple concept that we believe that there's no god but Allah and that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was his last messenger. Now, if you add anything else on to that, that's between you and Allah. But I'm here. My name is Imam Farooq Hanna, and I'm the resident Imam at the People's Mosque, the world's first and only 100% online mosque. I start out with that basic affirmation just to let you know that this mosque is here for that reason and that reason alone, to serve those other people that have made that affirmation, to serve those other people that have said, Asheru la shalnam de Rasulullah. Whatever you do after that, that's between you and Allah. We believe in the Quran because la ilaha Allah and the Sunnah, Muhammad Rasulullah. But we are not the judges of one another. We are the people that are here to love one another, to show brotherhood, to show sisterhood. And that is what we're here to do. Now, I'm, I'm introducing the format. So first, I'd like to tell you that I'm giving this khutbah from the side of the first of the people's musallas that's in Atlanta, Georgia. And it's also our operating epicenter. We're at 4664 Butner Row. You can look at the address on the website. If you are ever, no matter who you are, if you are ever in Atlanta, please come see us because we will make you feel very welcome and we'll make you, we'll, you'll know that this is a very open place. With that, I'd like to start our Juma Kutbah, the very first Juma Kutbah of the online mosque. One thing I'm gonna tell you, and I'm gonna try my best to hold myself to this, I have a timer here in front of me for a reason, because we're gonna try to keep this format down to 20 minutes. We know that you believe in Allah and we know that you care because you're watching this but we also know that we should be mindful of your time. Forcing you to listen to two and three hours of me running my big fat mouth is not necessarily the best thing in the world. So we're going to be pointed and pungent and get down to what needs to be done. And we're going to go ahead and, and get the chutbah done. Now to start out with a story. There was a man. Now, every last one of you I believe are familiar with this story, but we're going to shoot it out there. There's a man. This is in Sai Bukhari. Just for those who need to know it's authentic. There was a man that had never, let me say this again, had never done anything good in his entire life. Not one single iota of good had this man ever done on the planet Earth. And to boot, to make it worse, he killed 99 people. Let's be clear with this. We're not just talking about 99 people. We're talking about 99 people. That's somebody's mamas, daddies, 
sisters, brothers, uncles, cousins, everything. This man killed him and didn't do anything to help anybody else. He hits a point in his life where he feels like death is on its way and he says, I, I, I wanna change this. I wanna do something else. I wonder if there's forgiveness for me, if there's something I can do to be forgiven. So he seeks out a real wise man, a sheikh by all means, man who studied religion all his life, who devoted himself to nothing but good, who supposedly was the exact opposite of this man and had done nothing but good his whole life. And he asked him, is there any forgiveness for me? What can I do? I, you know, I don't want to die like this. I actually do believe in Allah. I believe that there's one God and I want him to forgive me for what I've done. Tell me how. Sheikh looks at him. How many Sheikhs you know that fit this bill? And says, no, man, ain't no forgiveness for you. Are you at your man? You killed 99 people. You done for, buddy, hell's where you going. I'm paraphrasing, of course. But the man says, well, I guess killing you just won't make it no worse. So he goes ahead and knocks him off too. Making it around 100. Now he leaves out there distraught. He's messed up, man. He's like, oh, you know, I came in for forgiveness and I just knocked off my 100th dude. So he decides to go look for another shepherd another learned man, and he finds him, and he asks him a simple question. Is there forgiveness for me? Can I go to heaven? Am I gonna be with the righteous? Can I be one of the righteous? And the Sheik tells him, of course. Of course there's forgiveness for you. Of course you can be with the righteous. And here is the requirement. You need to leave this place, it's evil, and go to those people who are good. Go to those people who believe in Allah. That's the definition of good, by the way. Those people who believe in the oneness of the Creator. It's simple. Those who do good things, even if they don't believe. But go around good folks. Now it's down the road there, quite a ways. You best head on out. So the man seeks that out, and along the way, he dies. Now come down to him, the angel of mercy and the angel of torment. And they had a conundrum. This man was seeking forgiveness. Do we throw him away into the hellfire? Or do we bring him up for heaven? So they said, let's measure the distance between where he left and where he was going to identify how serious he was and what he was doing. So they measure the distance and it comes up that the man was just a breath closer to where he was going than to where he came from. So he was buried with the righteous and he was sent to heaven. And the backside of that story is that he actually wasn't closer. He was further away. But Allah's forgiveness is so much that he shortened the distance for him. And he put the thing closer so that the man could get his forgiveness. Now there's some obvious lessons that we can take from that. But there's some not so obvious lessons to be taken from this. There's an obvious lesson that Allah is merciful. There's an obvious lesson that Allah wants his people. He loves you and he wants to be close to you. He wants you to have heaven. Hell is for the arrogant. Hell is for those who literally say, God don't exist, I don't care, and I'm gonna screw everybody. 
And then hell is haram for those people who at that point say, you know what? God is real. Allah is one. And if they've never done an ounce of good their whole life, that's enough. That's enough. So the other points of this that you got to take out of this is it's bigger than that. You got to turn around and say, well, that first guy he talked to. How many of us know sheikhs like that? Imams like that. Brothers like that. Sisters like that. Who f do not know of, are not aware, are not in tune with the forgiveness of Allah. They literally don't know. They believe somehow that by memorizing the Quran, which is a great thing, that becoming muhadith, which is a great thing, by studying and committing yourself to the will of Allah, which is a great thing, is enough to be close to Allah and to know Allah. And it is not. Our prophet told us very clearly, you will not enter heaven unless you love your brother more than you love yourself. Love is the cornerstone. There's a lesson in that. One, don't go to those people who don't understand it. I'm not saying they're bad. I'm not saying that they've done anything bad. But what I'm saying is, is that the true depth of Islam is in Allah's forgiveness and his love. And if you don't get that, if you somehow don't understand that, then you need to question your ability to give advice to others. So not only should you question your ability to inform other people of what Allah thinks, which you have no control over. You don't know what Allah thinks. We learned, but nowhere inside the kind of hadith does it tell us what Allah feels about Farouk, what Allah feels about Abdullah, what Allah feels about Jane, what Allah feels about John. It don't say it. So you don't have any right to profess what Allah didn't profess. And if you are with someone who doesn't understand that, you should question receiving knowledge from them. And the last thing that comes out of that one single part of the story is that when that person chose to judge this person who came to him as a knowledgeable person, a knowledgeable person, it ended in his own demise. And we have to be clear about that. Judging people ends in your own demise. So that's something that we need to get rid of. The sunnah of the prophet is not to judge people. When we say the people's mind is 100% non-judgmental, somebody wrote to me and said, I don't get that part of it. I said, it's about as simple as it is. It's the sunnah of, of, of our prophet. We don't judge. We are not the judge. One of the names of Allah is the judge. He's the judge. We are not the judge. We have a task. Once we have made a human choice and a choice. Remember that the first contract was written between Abraham, between Ibrahim. And when the prophet told us, you're Muslim, the way of Ibrahim is what you follow. We have a choice to choose to follow Allah. It's not forced on you. There is no compulsion. And the compulsion will be the topic of the second part of the kuppah. A'udhu billahi min shaitan ar-rajim. Bismillahi wa rahim Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu an na Muhammad Rasulullah. In the second part of our kuppah, I'd like to read a verse of Quran that I wrote down earlier. <clears throat> it's from Surah Baqarah, Ayat 256. It says, let there be no compulsion in religion. 
truth has been made clear from error. Therefore, whoever renounces shaitan, the devil, and believes in God, Allah, has grasped the firm handhold that will never break. Allah, whose handhold you have grasped, hears and knows all things. That's about as simple as it gets. Once you, Allah says first, that he has made it clear what's righteous and what's not. It's easy for you to see. Every person has a different background. Every person has different situations. And those situations were given to them from Allah. I don't want to speak of every single horror out there. But there's some of us that are going through some really hard times, have been through some really bad stuff. There's some of us who come from really great places and have not been through really bad stuff. There are some of us who've had one single moment in our life that changed us forever. But regardless of that, if you have said Ashaddu in la ilaha illallah wa ashaddu in la muhammadur rasulullah the firm is made the, the, the grasp the hand hold is firm and it's made right then and Allah doesn't make it light he says that grasp that hand hold is made between you and Allah that's it not between you and your cousin, you and your brother, you and the other brother who made that. We are bound through Allah to each other. We love each other because of our bond with Allah. That Allah says once you have made it, it is firm. The only way to break it, the only way to break it is to renounce Allah and embrace shaitan. But as long as you have Renounce the evils of the devil as you see it, as you understand it. And embraced the way of Allah. Embraced that Allah is real. Then that's all you need. So, in coming to close in our kutbah, keeping with our 20 minute format, The people's mosque has been built for you. It's been built to let others know that as long as you have the kalima to shahada, as long as you've made that affirmation, as long as you've renounced the devil and accepted Allah as the Quran asks you to, as long as you follow the way of Ibrahim and you have said, I want to be with Allah, that we consider you to be brother and sister and everything in between. It's open to you. Use it like you want to. It's your space. And we end as we began. All of my brothers and sisters are those who enjoy what is right and forbid what is wrong. And the only thing that we have to decipher the Muslims, those who submit to the will of God, is that they have submitted to the will of God. I should do in la ilaha illallah, or I should do in Muhammad Rasulullah. And that's the end of it. Become.